But I do appreciate being able to, first of all, be invited to speak here, and then secondly, to be able to impart, hopefully, some uh, lessons I have gleaned from the text that we'll be using from uh, looking at. If you would, turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to primarily focus on verse 34, but we're going to use this chapter to kind of lay some groundwork as to the purpose of what Jesus said in verse 34. I don't know anyone who doesn't like to have a peaceful day. Um, in, our, in the Blake home and Blake compound, because see there's three of us, three distinct families that live on our compound now where we're at. We don't have a turret with a machine gun or anything up, but we all live on the same basic property. And between those three households, we have been through a rough time the last two, three months. Between my daughter going to the hospital, I'm getting pneumonia, my wife has this, and then my sister moves into her new home and they spring a water leak and have to move in with my parents while they're repairing the house. I mean, it's just one thing after another. And I know my parents in particular would love to have just one peaceful day. <laughs> one peaceful day. I'm waiting this particular year, beginning in January, to have one week where we go through somebody's not sick. It's been a rough year. And who doesn't like the thought of peace? Our Miss America, many times each year, I don't watch it, but you know, I hear all these things they talk about. And one of the questions is, what is... What is one of the greatest things you would like to have uh, if you were Miss America? And one of the things they always get on is, I'd like to have world peace. You know, our society, uh, who now has developed a generation of safe space snowflakes, just loves the thought of peace. And you know, when I was preparing this, you know, when you got time to think about all this, I... I almost wanted to get up and give a public service announcement before I began this sermon because this, more, this afternoon, the things we're going to talk about are things that will drive people to safe spaces because they cannot take what the Word of God truly speaks about these things. Man craves peace. But the peace that man craves is defined by man and not by God. Because we look around as he thinks true peace is uh, free from uh, turmoil. Uh, it's quiet. It's tranquil. It's basically like a utopia. Nothing going on. I'm just enjoying the moment. And that's peace when we talk about peace in the minds of a lot of people. But Christ said in John 14 and verse 20, so I know I told you to go to Matthew 10, but I'm going to begin here in John 14. He says, Peace I live with you, leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Now listen to this. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, not as the world gives, the idea of a false sense of security and a false sense of, let's just have peace. But Jesus gives us true peace. He is the definition of peace. It's not, it doesn't matter what might be happening around you, what might be happening to you personally. You can have peace. What a beautiful yet seemingly ungraspable, grasp, graspable thought. How can I have peace when all around me is turmoil? That's the peace Jesus offers. The Prince of Peace. Jesus says we can have this peace, but there are conditions to this peace. You must be willing to do as he commands. And then we can have the peace that Jesus promised to each and every one of us. 
You know, if you rob a bank, uh, from the moment you decide to do that and it goes into action, there will not be a moment of peace. And it doesn't matter if 30 years down the road you're still not being caught by the police. What are you doing? You're constantly looking over your shoulder. You don't have a moment of peace. Fearing people are going to possibly rob you or turn you in or all manner of things. Or I'm going to lose the money that I have stolen. But you know, fearing God will also not give us peace either. If we fear God, and will his retribution regarding the sin that we're involved in, there will be no peace either. But Jesus brings peace. Peace not as the world, but peace from heaven. And what our world today needs more of than anything is peace. Not, divine, not defined by us, but defined by the word of God. And there will always be death. There will always be misery, suffering, wars, and on and on. But in the midst of all that, we can have peace. And so today we're going to look at some passages, particularly beginning in Matthew chapter 10. We're going to begin at verse 34. Jesus said here, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Sounds a little contradictory in what he has just said, what we read in John 14, but the point is, he's referring to, obviously then, there's two types of peace. There's the worldly peace, then there's the peace that comes from God. And he says, if you think I'm going to bring you peace, the worldly peace, guess what? It's not going to happen. How you define peace. He says in verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He, shall, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings a sword. The sword here is not the kind of, we think about, we look at Vikings and things like that. It's not that type of sword. It's more like a, what I would call a dagger. It's a, it's a shorter Thing. The idea I think about it in a sense is more close contact. A sword, you have a little bit of room between you and the other person. With a dagger, you don't. You've got to get right up on them. It's offens offensively used. And the idea that it's close to close, it's close combat, not like a long sword. And definitely not like a short pocket knife or something like that. And if we use this thought and what Jesus is getting across here, we see that the things that we are going to do here on this earth are not things that are from afar. They're up close and personal. The sword represents something that will cause families to call, cause splits in families. Among those people that we love, those that we may live with, or those whom we may have close, uh, close relationships with. Sometimes we think about the world and, and we're thinking of those people out there. But it's also those who are close to us. We will go to war with them for a short time, maybe, or it may be for the length of our lives while we're here on this earth. But whatever it is, Jesus says he brings a sword. It's going to cause division among those who are close. Jesus said another time in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, he says, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be ready, already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till I be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to bring peace on earth? That's the question that he asked them. You only bring peace where all these things are not going to be going on? He says, I tell you nay. 
but rather division. For, I'm, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. Father shall be divided against the son, and on he goes. The idea here is not only will it bring sword, but that sword causes division just by its very nature. The idea where he says, I tell you nay, is the idea of not, not indeed will this be, but division. Division in this case is commanded and it's allowed because we are fighting against those who want to hold on to sin, who want to do things contrary to the will of God. You know, division, this word it uses here is it's looked at, I looked it up, and it's the idea of being disunion of opinion and conduct. You know, as a Christian, we walk as new creatures. And by that very uh, life that we're going to live, it's going to cause us to not be able to be around other people, to be a part of them. That's the division that he talks about here. And it's commanded. It's, not, it's just a byproduct of the idea that if I'm going to obey God, then there's going to be division. A seemingly contradiction, when you look at 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, where it tells us there are to be no divisions among you. You know, it's just kind of interesting. You read all these passages and one says one thing, one says another. Well, you've got to take them in their entirety. What's he talking about here? Well, in particular... In Luke, the division is going to come among the household of God and the household of Satan. Those who seek to follow God, they are going to be divided from those of the household of Satan. Worldly people, non-Christians, maybe even erring Christians, of God, children of God, that cannot be at one with us because we seek to follow God first. And by doing that, we cannot be in unity with them. They must divide. We cannot have uh, the, the peace that comes to the Christians if we are weighed down by those who oppose God and ultimately oppose us. But in 1 Corinthians... In that context, he's talking there among Christians, the house of God. And he's telling them that you can't divide between, uh, between who you want to follow. You can't divide over matters of doctrine. You can't divide uh, over, you can come together and then once we've come together, we must stay united in realms of expediency and judgment. And if not, we will not have the peace that God promises, that Jesus promised. The world is a proving ground for those who profess to be Christians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19, it tells us there that there must also be heresies among you, that they that are approved may be made manifest among you. Heresies, the idea of divisions, parties. Within the Lord's church. And the Bible says they're there for a purpose. To reveal those who are approved of God. Against those who are not approved of God. And these passages show clearly that we can have peace. But it's at a cost. You know we have a song. Uh, that talks about the cost and it gets into the idea have you counted the cost and one of the costs of being a Christian is realizing that I can't associate and be in fellowship with just anybody and everybody to have the peace that Christ promised there's going to be disunity there's going to be division the sword the word of God as we read in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 the sword is the word of God. And so as I hold on to this sword, I realize that as I hold on to God's word, it by itself is going to cause the division among us and the rest of the world. 
But why do we have this cost? What is this cost? The first would be that I must uh, become a New Testament Christian and receive the gospel of peace. And the cost is going to bring me to a crossroads that many times that I will have in my life. Well, I will have to ask a question. Do I follow my family or do I follow God? Do I follow my friends or do I follow God? Do I follow my husband or my wife or I do what God wants me to do? What about my daughter or my son or God? The preachers, the elders, the leaders in the church, or God. It will be a life at times that will be very lonely. It is sad to me that I have to drive 50-something miles just to meet with another faithful congregation. And if I go north, it's another three and a half or so hours to meet a congregation, north, more or less. Anyway, I have to go far north or far south, but there's nowhere close around. Anytime I'm going to travel, I find out very quickly there are a lot of churches out there, but there are not a lot that Christ would approve of. So therefore, I can't fellowship them. I can't worship with them. It wasn't so growing up. It more or less it had Church of Christ across the board. You could go over there and it, it would be just like visiting, being at your home congregation. The things that were going on there. Now, whoo, there's no telling what might happen in there. Just no telling. It will be a life of misery and pain in the sense of the physical. And that's when I rely upon the peace that comes from God. It's not based upon confusion, but upon the peace of God. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as, all, as in all the churches of the saints. It is something that we add by the Spirit in Galatians 5 and verse 22. Peace is one of those things. Why do we not have peace? Well, I want to go back to Matthew 10 and just quickly because we don't have a lot of time. But I want to very quickly kind of go over Matthew chapter 10 and give us some context of why would Jesus say what he's saying. When the first seven or so verses we have here where Jesus calls the twelve... And he's now about to give them marching orders and basically tell them, if you're going to be amongst this twelve, these are the things that you're going to go through. He tells them in verse 8 that you're going to be able to heal the sick, going to perform all manner of miracles, and even pulling those from the dead. A side note here when I was reading it, not part of my sermon necessarily, but it proves a point. He says there that they will freely you have received, freely give. Our modern day miracle workers today, what is the first thing they want you to do? They want some money. Freely you have, freely you give. Secondly, don't take money and things with you, why? Because they will have opportunities among the faithful to be supported. They don't need those things. God will take care of them. But the idea is that you will go into different cities. Verse 11. You're going to come to a house in verse 12. And you're going to salute it. And if the house is worthy, it's worthy of your saluting. But he gets into another type of house. A house is not worthy to be saluted. He says, take your salute back. He goes on and talks about how that many of them were not going to receive you. You see, this is that division, but he begins by explaining to them, you can have this because you're an apostle. You're a chosen to go out and do these things. He says in verse 16, well, he tells him in verse 14, when, when they will not hear your words, you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. 
And I know that's taken out of context among the denominational world. You keep it in context, he's talking here about there will be those that will not listen, well then you just move on. They're not worthy to receive the gospel because they're not, their hearts are not willing to listen, to be molded by the gospel itself. Verse 16, he said, I sent you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like much peace is going to come to those who are going to follow Jesus Christ. You're a sheep. We've had sermons on already about sheep. We need a shepherd. We need somebody to take care of us, look out for us. Why? Well, first and foremost, he says here, because there's wolves out there. And they're seeking to destroy you, to cause you harm. He says, be ye therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Beware of men, verse 17, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Folks, we are not very far from that here in the United States of America. I'm sorry to say it. Brethren, standing up for what's right, you know, already in Canada, other places like that, they were changing laws where it's a hate crime to stand up against homosexuality and all manner of sins that people are involved in today. Our courts are so silly that if you stand up and teach against abortion or anything else, somebody can take you to court. That's how silly our judicial system has become. All these things are going on even today. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake, verse 18. Those that will deliver you up, uh, verse 19. Take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it will be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. Now I know we're talking here the miraculous revelation here and dealing with these apostles. But if you've studied the Bible and you do your due diligence, not only as a gospel preacher, but as an average member of the Lord's church, and you're doing all that you can, the words are there. Prepare to give a defense. That's what we're commanded to do in 1 Peter. Be able to give a defense. Well, that's the idea here. A brother will bring up, uh, will speak, uh, will deliver up the brother to death. Verse 21, the father and the child, and the child shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Your own family are going to turn against you because you stand up for Jesus Christ. They will persecute you, verse 23. You're going to be hated of all men, verse 22. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. He tells them, don't fear those from without, verse 26. For there is nothing, fear not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, they speak that speak ye in the light, and what you hear in the ear, that you preach unto the housetops. Then verse 28, fear not them that shall kill the body, but they are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He talks about the sparrows. He talks about the literal hairs on your head, the idea of relationship that God has with each, every individual. You've got to count the cost. If you're going to be a New Testament Christian, you've got to be prepared. Revelation 2 and verse 10, even to the giving of your life, to stand for the gospel. But there's peace in all this. Some will look at that and think, what peace? You're telling me I might even have to die for this? Yes. Because it's not what people can do to this physical body. That's not what you need to be concerned about. If you die in a faithful state, there's nothing you have to worry about. person we need to be concerned about is God because he's able to not only destroy this body but also our souls he's the giver of that soul he can destroy that soul so I can have peace in knowing that no matter what people may do to me out here in this world 
No matter things they may say about me. Earlier he talks about how that uh, they call me Beelzebub. What do you think they're going to call you? The idea of the attitude that people have toward you. You're going to be the son of Satan. That's what they're going to call you. But Jesus didn't tell them, give up. It's not the right time. Our world isn't ready for this. No, what he tell them? He says, you go out and you preach the gospel to every creature, to every person that will listen. That's what the job is for all of us. Whosoever shall deny me before men, he will also deny before my Father, which is in heaven, verse 33. And then we talk about peace. Think that I am not, do not think that I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. The very idea is here that we're not here to stir things up just for the sake of stirring things up. I'm not here to stand for what everybody, stand against what everybody in the world wants to do just because I want to be the bad guy. No, I do it because that's what I'm commanded to do. And by, by doing that, there will not be peace in how the world views peace. The peace I gain comes from God. Why do some Christians not have peace? Well, first of all, their lives are not in harmony with God's word. The New Testament Christianity is based upon the idea of the all-sufficiency of the word of God. It will give me everything I need to get through this life. God's will is for mankind is revealed there in the Holy Scriptures. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You know, when our conduct doesn't measure up to the word of God, we cannot have peace. We must make sure our lives match up to the word of God. And that is our duty, the idea of correcting the error in our lives. It is a result, secondly, of a prayerless life. People do not have a right relationship with God. They don't talk to God continuously in their lives. Seems like in a lot of people's lives, the only time they want to talk to God is when things are going bad. When things are going well, not a whole lot of prayers going before God. But in our lives, we need to be praying for the good and for the bad. There in the bad times. But since God created man, he knows man's needs. The things that we aspire to. And he is vitally concerned about them. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, we're reminded to cast all our care upon him, for he careth for you. A third thing that happens... We become too self-centered. Matthew 22 and verse 39, and the second is the like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, we heard about the me generation. Well, that's a little bit of what's going on with a lot of people today. Not just that generation, but the generations before and the generations after. We're more concerned about me, about myself. We give all of our affection, all of our time and effort is expended upon me. What will this get me? What can I have from this? It's all about I, me. The Bible is very clear that one of life's major purposes that each, and other, each one of us has is to help others. One of them is to help others. It's the idea of getting focus off me and putting it upon the needs of others. Acts 10 verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. This attitude is shown in Matthew 20 and verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to this earth 
about himself. He was already perfect. He was already without sin. He came because we're not. He died because we're not perfect. And we had sin in our lives. Too often many people think the world owes them a living. But the truth is, we owe the, the world a life of helping one another. Fourth reason we don't have peace is because the world has such a strong call upon each and every one of us. You know, some just have not turned their lives over from sin. I think about Lot's wife. What was her problem? Well, she went, she left with them from the city, but what did she do? It says she looked back when she was told not to. And that look there is not just a, a, a fleeting glance. The idea is she looked back thinking about all that she's leaving behind because it had a pull on her. She wasn't really ready to give all that up. I think about that and I think about people that I've come in contact in my life. You know, we're okay, like I say, when it comes to you. When it comes to the world. We're okay in cutting ties and, and doing the things we got to do to... to, to uh, to stay away from those bad influences. But boy, when it becomes one of my sons or my daughters or my favorite preacher, my favorite preaching school, my favorite college. You know, I don't even talk about Freed Hardeman. <laughs> I graduated from there. I also went to Oklahoma Christian for two years. Y'all might not know, I went three two or three years. Then I transferred to Freed because I thought they were better. And in some senses they were. They had not slipped as bad as Freed had at that time. But um, the Bible department had its problems then. There was a time when we needed to stand up against one of the deans, particularly his wife, because she stood up in a, in a chapel assembly, men and women present, and basically told all the women there that you can have it all. Don't worry about your kids. Don't worry about your husband. Get out there and you can have it all. I went to the Bible department and they were very hands off. I wanted one of them to sit down with me and help me write this letter out because if anybody knows, well, most of you don't because you see the final print. But I am not an English major. I do, I speak, and then I write worse than I speak in regards to the English language. I can write a run on that will last a whole paragraph. Just put a couple of commas in there, some semicolons, and boy, we're good to go. And then my wife gets hold of it, and then my daughter gets hold of it, and I got 20 pages, but boy, when they're done, I'm down to about 10. And then I got to build it back up, because a lot of these people want 15 pages, so I got to put more in there. Well, then there's another process of going back through the editors. But the idea here is, is that I needed help, and I couldn't get help. And you know who helped me? Todd Deaver. He was there too. And uh, Les Bonnet. People like that. They weren't on this Holy Spirit kick, at least not to me. That was back in 92, 90, 92, somewhere around in there. That was before all this stuff came up, but the idea is that they helped me. And I wrote this, and the Bible department didn't want to have anything to do with it. Didn't want to be a part of it. Didn't want to have it. Why? Because it was one of the dean's wives. And I put that out there, and I had a lot of people came on campus, had some girls that were very thankful for what I wrote. They said that to me personally. And then I had a lot 
of guys and girls that wanted to string me up because I went against the dean's wife. Not because of what I said, but because I went against the dean's wife. I say all that to say this. I don't broadcast I came from her. I'm not unhappy I came from there, but the idea there is is that if they're wrong, they're wrong, and they are. They were wrong when I was there. And they've only gotten worse, just like the rest of the world has only gotten worse. I wouldn't send my daughter to any of those schools. I'm hoping she finds one close so I can at least spend another four or five more years with her after that. The idea here is, is that the call of the world People looking back. Demas, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. He loved this present world. He gave up salvation. And only that, following Paul, he gave that up because he loved the world. Some love pleasures more than God. Their minds are on earthly things. They cannot, the idea of being double-minded. And in all of that, you can't have peace. Your mind's on the world, your mind's on God. Back and forth, back and forth. There's no peace there. I think there's a clinical definition. That's schizophrenia, isn't it? Where you have multiple personalities, you're able to go back and forth. That's, that's what a lot of people are living today. Peace of the world. The peace of the world is no peace at all. No true peace. We, if faithful to God, can have peace no matter what is going on around us. In Philippians 4 and verse 7, we are told we can have a peace that passes all understanding. But it says it comes through Christ. In order to have the peace that Jesus promised, the Prince of Peace, the true peace. I have to be a New Testament Christian. But not just that. I have to be a faithful New Testament Christian. So that no matter what's going on around me, what others may say, what happens in my life, what happens in everybody else's life, no matter how this government goes, no matter what war we're involved in, what laws we're passing, I can still have peace because I know that I am in a right relationship with God. And in the end, that's truly what matters. Not what the government's doing. Not how many abortions we have, even though it is an ungodly act. Murder. No matter how many children are dying every day. What matters is that I have godly peace. Thank you for your time.